the Washington consensus is embedded in the European uh, Union's bureaucracy, in the European Commission, where ultimately this entity is, is part of, of a hegemonic project. And of course, the end game is the TTIP. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you in a conversation that is being recorded on the 12th of July, 2016. And as we sit here in the second week of July, 2016, the European Union is embarking on a new era in the wake of the Brexit referendum that was held late last month in the United Kingdom. And the question mark hovering over the European Union is causing a lot of people to scratch their heads uh, even about what the European Union is. Even people living under the European Union don't necessarily know what it is. And very few of them know about the deep history going back, not just to the Cold War era, but even preceding that, that set the groundwork for this organization and what it has become. So joining us today to help us sort through this and understand better what is really happening in Europe, we are joined once again by the director for the Center for Research on Globalization at globalresearch.ca, Michelle Chosodovsky. Michelle, thank you very much for your time today. Delighted to be on the program. Perhaps you can begin by telling us about the real origins of the European Union, not just the origins that everyone knows about the Treaty of Rome and the Maastricht Treaty and things of that nature, but maybe the the prehistory of the European Union that situates that in the proper context for us to understand what the objective of this union is. Well, I think we first have to recall that in the immediate uh, wake of World War II, we had what was called the Marshall Plan. It was a reconstruction program, largely initiated by the United States, and it was also a means uh, for the United States to establish a corporate hub within within Western Europe. And um, while the Marshall Plan was ongoing, we also had the onset of the Cold War, which consisted essentially in isolating the Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain was not strictly a political curtain, it was also an economic curtain. And um, its main objective was to prevent any kind of trade and investment relations taking place between Western Europe uh, and, and the Soviet bloc countries. And uh, ultimately, when the the European community was created under the Rome Treaty in 1957, this was essentially a Cold War structure. Um, It was also a a U.S. initiative indirectly um, as part of a a broader hegemonic project. Uh, I think this is coming to light in recent events. It wasn't clear at the time. And what happened is that the European space in the 1950s was essentially divided into three, into three areas. One, you had the, the first six members of the European community, the Europe of the six, and then it started to expand. Then you had um, the European Free Trade Agreement, which uh, regrouped a number of what we might call neutral countries. Um, And these neutral countries, they weren't associated with with NATO. They essentially Scandinavia, Switzerland, Austria, um, and that formed a separate um, trade agreement. Uh, And I should mention that the European European community or the European Union, as it evolved, uh, essentially started to coincide with with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which was the main uh, instrument of of Cold War geopolitics, uh, which was consistently threatening Russia. Now, it's interesting to note that in recent developments this week, the, the notion of the EU and NATO more or less merging, so to speak, melding together, is, is, is a talking point um, of analysis and opinion. And so that, that is the background. The Cold War created a situation uh, which isolated Russia uh, and the Soviet Union. Um, and 
what happened subsequently is that the Soviet Union started to establish trade with other countries, including the non-aligned movement, okay, the, the countries of the third world, had, which had become independent, and, um, and in a sense also encroaching on, on um, traditional colonial uh, trading relations, um, because these were former colonies of the West. And then eventually what happened uh, in the wake, of course, of the Cold War is that all these structures um, started to tumble. I should mention that um, the Soviet bloc countries had their own trade uh, trading system, which was called Comic-Con. It was the Council of, Eco of Mutual Economic uh, Cooperation, uh, which they developed uh, with the countries of Eastern Europe, as well as other countries like uh, Vietnam, Cuba, and so on. Um, and then there was also a period of, of trade with, with China and so on and so forth. Now, what has happened, now, uh, the, there's another important element in all, in all this, is that if we go back to the early um, 1920s, there was a conference in Genoa, it was called the Genoa Conference, in which um, nations of, of Western Europe, Soviet Union met, um, and um, uh, the Soviet Union at the time announced the, its principle of peaceful coexistence between competing economic systems and the notion of socialism in one country. And they wanted, actually, they expressed the desire to have trade with the West. Now, that was never uh, an option for Western Europe, um, and largely as a result of, of U.S. influence. And I should mention that in the, in the 20s, uh, Russia had trade with uh, Germany during the Weimar Republic, but it didn't have trade with the Western powers, which, of course, was supporting the insurrection in, uh, in, in southern Russia. So that is the background. Um, and now we've reached a point, well, we, we've reached a point of evolution. First of all, after the Cold War, uh, we saw a large number of, of new countries entering. Um, and uh, these countries um, were members of the former Soviet uh, bloc, uh, so to speak, Poland, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and so on. And, and then there were other countries which were more on the periphery of, of the European economy, uh, such as Portugal, uh, of course, Portugal, Spain, Greece, uh, and so on, the Republic of Ireland, which joined the European Union. And uh, the evolution that took place from the late 50s, early 60s to the 90s was... Um, the Maastricht Treaty in 1992. Now, why is the Maastricht Treaty so important? Uh, essentially, the Maastricht Treaty it, it embeds a neoliberal economic policy um, perspective uh, within its, uh, its, its, um, its articles of agreement, uh, but specifically it refers to, to monetary policy. And it's the, it creates conditions whereby the individual member states are not allowed to use monetary instruments to mobilize internal resources and, uh, and deal with internal debt operations. In other words, you can't finance your internal development without borrowing money from outside. And now eventually what happened is that the, the Maastricht Treaty then evolved towards the Eurozone. Of course, not all members of the European Union are members of the Eurozone, but the Eurozone essentially means you have a European Central Bank, which then um, controls monetary policy in each of the member states and ultimately creates debt. And that's the plight, let's say, of Greece. It's the plight of, many, of several countries, um, whereby the, the centralized power of the European Central Bank ultimately creates conditions of economic collapse and mass indebtedness precisely because uh, it, it disallows countries to use their central banks to mobilize resources. And also putting forth this notion of independence of the central bank, namely that the, the central bank does not um, does operate separately from the government. So that is a little bit the background. Um, and... Uh, 
Today, I would say that European Central Bank is controlled by, by Wall Street. And the same thing is true for the Bank of England. Both of them are led by former employees or officials of Goldman Sachs. So does this mean in this reading that the European Union is still an economic dagger aimed at the heart of Russia, uh, uh, essentially? That this is a form of economic warfare that, uh, that drives, a heart, uh, drives the wedge between Europe and Russia? I, I would say, uh, yes, I, I think it does drive a wedge because the European bureaucracy, um, which really takes its origin with the Lisbon Treaty 2007, of course it existed previously, but it, it, it provides it with a, a, a legal framework and it prevents individual countries from really having bilateral trade agreements, let's say, with other countries without going through the, Euro without going through the Brussels bureaucracy. And the, the dynamics today, particularly with the geopolitics, the threats directed against the Russian Federation, NATO's uh, uh, expansion, what it is essentially uh, is to restore the Iron Curtain to re restore the economic iron curtain. And at the same time, it, uh, it is there also to preclude uh, the ability of the Russian Federation to enter into agreements with other countries which are outside the European space, such as Brazil or, or uh, you know, many countries in Africa and so on and so forth, which they had, they had that in the 1950s. They had it during the Cold War era. Okay? So that it, essentially it, it is a policy to isolate Russia from an economic standpoint and it, it, it more or less merges with NATO because NATO is the military arm of the Europe, well, it's the military arm of the Western Alliance, of the Atlantic Alliance, but uh, it, it encompasses uh, uh, most of the member states of the, European, uh, of the European Union. And as a consequence now, uh, the, the confrontation between, between Western Europe and um, or the West and the Russian Federation uh, is also in the realm of trade. Then is the issue of sanctions. And in, and in fact, um, what is now happening is that the European Union uh, is impoverishing the member states. And I, I should say there's another element when I, I said the neoliberal agenda is embedded in the European Union. Well, in effect, it really is, it really embeds, so to speak, the IMF uh, uh, World Bank perspective. The Washington consensus is embedded in the European uh, Union's bureaucracy, in the European Commission, so that when they act in relation to individual countries, they're, they are, in effect, replicating the actions of the International Monetary Fund, in, let's say, in relation to third world countries, except these are not third world countries. And so, uh, ultimately, um, what, is, uh, what is happening is that the Washington consensus of the, you know, the Breton Woods institutions, uh, the U.S. Treasury, the think tanks, I, I would add also, of course, Wall Street is behind all that, okay? And ultimately, what we see unfolding is uh, the U.S. colonization of the European Union, where ultimately this entity is, is, is indirectly uh, part of, of a hegemonic project. And of course, the end game is the TTIP. It's, uh, it's the Trade and Investment Partnership, the Atlantic Partnership, which, uh, which is really contiguous to the Atlantic Alliance and Military Affairs. And uh, it would then merge the European Union, including the former members of Comicon, into a giant trading agreement uh, encompassing the United States uh, of course, Canada would also be included, but there's a separate agreement, which is called CETA, uh, and the European Union, and, and essentially that is an imperial project. Now, uh, I don't, uh, we, we have to see how this is going to evolve, 
because the European countries have their own uh, people and their own agendas and their own movements. And uh, there's increasingly awareness, increasing awareness of the nature of, of this project. So we've gone from World War I Genoa conference to the TTIP. That is the trajectory. It's an interesting trajectory, and it raises the question, um, uh, the, the Brexit vote and the various uh, movements in various European countries that are agitating for leaving the European Union at this moment, represents in this view a type of anti-imperialist movement, an attempt to, st to strike a blow against the imperial project. And yet, it is portrayed as mindless right-wing neo-Nazi nationalists who just hate immigrants. That's the way it's being portrayed. Is there a discrepancy between the consciousness of the people who are involved in this anti-European movement and the actual end goal of the anti-European movement? Well, there are various political cleavages which are operating simultaneously with different agendas, different ideological perspectives. So it's very difficult to give a straightforward answer to that question. I think that they're, they're, I would say on the one hand, there are people within individual countries uh, which realize that the European Union has destroyed their society and their, 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 their national project. I think Greece is the most notorious example, but you might say that Spain as well, uh, certainly, uh, well, uh, and, and Spain and Portugal possibly, uh, people start to realize that the European Union is in fact a form of IMF in disguise and, uh, and it's, it's derogating their social programs uh, and, and, the, their, and their identity as nation states. Now, there's another perspective, and I think it's also a very valid perspective, is that people in, in Western and Eastern Europe realize their historical links, and they still believe in a European project. But that European project is not going to be controlled by the Washington Consensus or the Brussels bureaucrats. It's a union of, of, uh, of uh, values and people all of which, in effect, have, have common origins. I mean, you know, uh, Britain is, uh, is really created by Scandinavian tribes that invaded the Anglos, the Angles, and then the Saxons, and then the Normans, and so on. And uh, France is really a construct which was the, the result of the Germanic invasions. The Franks were Germanic. Of course, none of this is really... Uh, but it's there, and, and, and so... The European people have this identity, and I, and I think it's important that both the, the, the nationalism, uh, which is required to maintain um, sovereignty, economic and social sovereignty, by the member states, which would be, let's say, an exit from the, from the prevailing European Union. That, of course, is an important undertaking. But at the same time, and, and the two things are not incompatible, is the notion that we should ultimately democratize the European Union, get rid of the bureaucrats, get rid of the Washington Consensus, and build a Europe, which a, Europe, a Western Europe, which has links with other countries, um, with uh, the Russian Federation, with China, and so on and so forth. And, um, and it, then it, re it raises the issue, what kind of society do we really want? Do we, do we want global capitalism? Do we want to have some, do we want to restore some of the democracies of, uh, social democracies which existed historically and so on and so forth? But I, I think that's the way I, I, I would see it uh, evolving at, at this moment. And of course, the, the main thing is for the European people, whatever their perspective, to oppose the TTIP. Because the TTIP is ultimately an instrument of conquest, which would essentially transform uh, the European Union member states into into territories of of the of the United of the U.S. imperial project. It's a very astute analysis, and one that I think cuts a lot deeper and closer to the bone than a lot of the analyses that we see, uh, in, certainly in the mainstream media, even in a lot of the, the progressive press and other places that are uh, simply uh, reacting in a knee-jerk fashion to what's going on here, rather than looking at that more holistic picture. So I thank you for bringing that perspective to the table. Michelle Chosodovsky, globalresearch.ca, thank you very much for your time.
Thank you very much. And delighted to be uh, on the program again. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the 2010 Video Archive DVD. Buy your copy today at corbettreport.com.